Yeah, right. A little early. Hello. Hello, everyone. Nice day today. 85, 87 degrees in Massachusetts. Yeah. No one's here yet. Nice day. Totally understand. Everyone will be getting ice cream or something nice out there. Hey, Data Guru 18. Yeah. How are ya? Hey, Zen. How are you? How are you? So, uh, you know the drill. Mic check, video check. Check, check. Hey, Freedom Pfeiffer. How are you? It's been a while. Uh, 85 in Massachusetts. Yep, it is 85 right now outside here in Massachusetts. It is going to be the same tomorrow, and then it's going to be 60 degrees on the weekend. Hey, nice June 09. Yeah, it's been a while. How are you, Freedom Pfeiffer? Well, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Freedom Pfeiffer is a former student. Trusty former student. Are you still at, um... Am I am I am I allowed to tell you that I say where you where, where you're working at? Uh, do you still work at that place that starts with a G in in Portland, Oregon? Freedom, freedom on here. You know, freedom Pfeiffer. He's still on, still with us. Yeah, you do. You work at Galois. Uh, okay, good. Um, so. Um, you're still there, okay, which is good, which is good. We need you, you know, especially in uh, in that field. Um, off the, you know, uh, on a note, I just want to let you know, just, uh, you know, Freedom Pfeiffer. Um, I uh, don't know about you, but I've been struggling to keep up with uh, friends and former students, uh, you know, who are getting laid off. Apparently, there's going to be another big round next Wednesday at Meta. So... Yeah, it's uh, really rough times economics right now in, in, in tech. So, all right. So I just want to let you know, um, I'm having a hard time keeping up. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, send me a message when you're, when you're around. Yeah, it was, uh, it's not, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Zan. Yeah, it's it's something new every day. I mean, I'm just getting new stuff like all the time. Um, I really shouldn't be saying this on the air, but I even got like messages from yeah from current students who are like you know, um, yeah, who just recently just just got laid off. And what I can offer you is, you want me to send me a. Uh, Send me a resume. I can do a review. I mean, that's one thing I can definitely offer to do, and I'll get yeah, I'll get you some. I'll get you results back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people means a lot, um, especially in this time. Yep. So yeah, if you want, then just send me a uh, send me a resume uh, for a review. Um, also, some places are way better than others. Like security is still growing. Oh, shoot. Hold on. No, not really bad code. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, hold on. We're not doing really bad code. I think it's a little bit too late now. Now. Well, you know what? Hold on. I don't know if it changed. I don't think it did. But... Oh, thanks for your kind word, Freedom. So, Bobby Table 24, are we going to go over your tw Comp 20 project final? So, it's funny. Um, today, I, think I don't think there's much time left. I think this is going to be the second, the third, the last class of the semester. But, actually, today is, well, a big continuation of really, really, really bad code. It is a really bad code. Okay, so the title did change. I'm not sure how the heck that works on Twitch. Um, well, I guess we start right now. Um, yeah, hello everyone. 4.33, well, a little running, but that's fine. Um, 
so uh, I do the drill. I'm associate teaching Professor Ming Chao, um, and this is my security course at Tufts. Uh, and today, all, everything that we've done throughout this whole semester leads up to this big topic. So I want to ask you, name one thing that you've learned so far in this course. Now, I know there's a whole bunch of people that actually, it's a bunch of people who, who are actually, you know, uh, just had been just watching the videos. What's one thing that you have learned in this class so far? Actually, if you've only been doing just the Twitch stream, that's fine. What's the one thing? I don't know about that, Bobby Table. All right, now you're getting me nervous here. Yeah, the internet is a bunch of cat pictures, okay? Yep, anything else? What else have you learned and done? CTF, okay, yeah, what else? Give me another thing. We'll do a running list. We'll do a running list. CTFs. I'm just going to mention one thing, which I don't think a lot of people think about. It's what we did last week, static and dynamic analysis. Breadcrumbs to keep digging. Yep. What kind of breadcrumbs? There's a lot of breadcrumbs. You can even expand on that. You can even do that. What else? What else have you learned? What else? What else? Come on. Oh, I do need to make a note about one thing I need to say at the end of today. Network sniffer, PCAP, yep, yep. Virtual machine, we did? Not so much, but hey, okay. All right, well, what is interesting is I don't think I talk too much about virtual machines this semester. Probably a lot less than most other times. Hey, Percy. Um, but I want, interestingly enough, which I have to mention about virtual machines today. Don't trust the internet. Well, Percy, uh, that's, well, that's going to be a big gist of today. Unfortunately, it's even worse. All right, you know what? I'm not going to waste anyone's time today. It's a nice day. Uh, we're going to need we're gonna be to do a lot of demos today, hands-on. Probably some eye-popping ones. I know one of them should be eye-popping. But everything that we've done, and if you watch all my older videos, everything leads to one final topic, big topic of this class, malware. Malware and malware analysis. Now, if I taught this course with starting with malware first, I think it would be really, really hard for anyone to really understand what's going on. The, the topic of malware is something that I think I, everyone should, if not like everyone should have encountered with at least once in their lifetime. How um, I remember getting hit with malware and really, really bad software. Um, I, I don't know who, who, who broke into my, my computer when I was a senior at, at Tufts. That was not a good sign. But it's one of those topics I think a lot of people are very familiar with, if not too familiar with, if not affected by it. But yeah, uh, today is going to be all about malware and malware analysis. Yeah. So, let's just get started. Like, why do we cover malware in this court? Is malware still a thing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, malware is still definitely a topic. It's one of these topics that have actually been consistently on the radar for, a little, for year after year after year. And it's still a big problem. Back in the heydays, malware, where a lot of them was really, you know, a lot of nuisance. But now, malware have turned to be really sinister. Uh, like deleting all the files on your computer, stealing, like, data and photos off of your computer, and even holding your 
your machine and your data for hostage. This is also the biggest problem is there's also a lot of misunderstanding and misconceptions, especially when you deal with terminology. Uh, a good example is, I'm sure a lot of you folks have heard of the term worm and virus. But the problem is people use them interchangeably. There's a huge difference between the two, which we will talk about today. Uh, and look, everything that we've done in this course, you know, everything that you listed, like PCAP, capture the flag, how the web works, static and dynamic analysis, password cracking, they're all part of malware. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, use crypto jacking and store the team during the capture the flat. Yep. That, like that. Key loggers. All malware. All of that stuff is malware. So first of all, I want to make a disclaimer. I don't, we may have special guests today. It's one of those weird, it's one of those weird topics that we may have special guests. Because I will be mentioning a lot of people today. Uh, I'm not the expert in malware or malware analysis. If you want to consult with a malware or malware analysis, we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, we're going to have a nice surprise coming. So first of all, let's, have, let's do the most important part of malware is we got to do uh, basic definitions. Definition number one, so what is malware? Malware is based off of two words, malicious software. Malware is just malicious software. Plain bad, there is no, okay, here's the thing, malware is just plain bad. It's bad, okay, bad stuff. Now, there are many different types of malware, including uh, virus, worm, backdoor, Trojan horse, rootkit, and ransomware. Now, think of organized crime. One time when I met with people at BBN in Cambridge, the way that they describe malware for me actually makes perfect sense, and this is actually the analogy that I actually use. Think of malware as like organized crime. There's just a bunch, there's a lot of different families, and these are the big families of malware. Virus, worm, backdoor, Trojan horse, rootkit, and ransomware. Now, for each and every one of these quote unquote families of uh, malware, there are even subfamilies, okay, that do different things. And also, actually, are, well, they also leave behind certain signatures, including like a uh, group of hackers, countries that are actually behind them, all right? A zombie is just an infected or compromised computer or computing device, any computing device. That even includes iPad, phone. Uh, tablet, uh, you name it, okay? A zombie is just an infected or compromised machine, also known as owned. A botnet, a botnet is just a network infected machine can be used by the user performed denial of service attacks. Yes, this is actually a thing. You can actually rent out network of infected machine to do really nefarious things such as denial of service attacks for pennies on the dollar. If you think I'm actually pulling your leg and I'm actually laughing at you, well, let me just do a Google search. Okay, uh, rent a zombie uh, for DDoS. There it is, DDoS for hire. Want to rent a botnet? There you go. This is back in, this is an article from 2010. Oh man, what the hell? That was not cool. Did I get that? Yep, they call DDoS for higher services. Yep, there it is. Hackers step out dealing with user zombie armies. Here we go. Yep, there you go. Usually, sometimes as many as 20,000 machines will rent these to hackers. Yep. Uh, I want to see how much they did. They, you now have gone to like pennies on the dollar. Here you go. Uh, here it is, DDoS botnet. Here we go. DDoS botnet from Imperva. I'll copy this link. You know what a DDoS is. It should be a price guide here. Here you go. One month, $23.99. One month uh, with a little bit more uh, power help. With multiple power, $34.99. And $44.99 for 10 years. Yay! Not a joke. This was written in when? I don't know when this was written. But yeah, not making any of this stuff up. No one bought nets. There you go. That's a zombie. We'll come back to this one later. Uh, a bot herder or a bot master is the attacker or attacker who control a botnet. One thing is, is uh, called, the last thing is called command and control. Either CNC or C2. 
this infrastructure of software, servers that control malware and, bot and, and the botnet. Yeah. Okay. So here's some really basic terminologies. A lot of times now I see a lot of like modern literature on malware reference C2 a lot. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to actually cover, we're definitely going to cover virus, worm, backdoor, uh, and you'll also get an idea of what I mean, I have Trojan horses as well too. Okay, so the first piece of malware we are going to look at is a computer virus. All right, anyone here a biology buff here? Now, I'm not going to go to the next slide. I'm not going to actually go to the next slide because I want to talk this one through because it kind of seemed, well, especially what's been going on for the last few years, it's been kind of obvious, kind of a little bit too obvious. How can someone here just give a brief explanation of a biological virus? How does a biological virus work? Go for it. Anyone? Biological virus. Nah, nah, nah. How does a biological virus work? Biological, in real life. Not a Trojan horse. No, no, no. I want to know how a biological virus works. Anyone in the medical? Anyone? No, 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 tricking me. Okay, okay, okay. All right. So what I'm to play, I'll ask the question and not necessarily, excuse me, Kyle. Okay, I see trick cose, like a self copy. Okay, I see a self copy. I hear that. Yeah, okay. But hey, in the natural world, how does a biological virus work? In fact, actually, you know what? I didn't want to go down this road, but I will. Give me an example of a of a of a common of a common virus out there. However, you cannot say the C word. Let's do that. Give me an example of a real virus, but you cannot say the C word. Hijack some other organizer. I need to. Yeah. Okay. Give me an example of a biological virus. One that you see or that that you. I'm sure everyone have felt one of these days. And again, do not mention the C word. The thing that we can't say, yes. Influ okay, perfect. All right, all right. The flu is a perfect example. So, I, I, Astrophy and KQJ, just give me an idea. Just give us an idea of how the flu works. Yep, avocado, it replicates itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, it replicates itself, it hijacks the organisms and resources, it does a, make, make copies. Well, how, how, how do you get the flu? How do you get the flu? Again, let's not say this in, okay. Um, you know, if this was an in-person class, I would have just, uh, I, I would have made a rule. Should anyone actually say the C word or that virus? All right, we're leaving. We don't want to talk about that thing. I think we're getting so sick of it. How is, like, how do we get the flu? Yeah, you get in touch with someone. <laughs> yeah, with someone with the flu. Breathing, that, there you go. All right. Like Christy, germs, astrophy, you know, if you want to spread the flu, it's very, you know, you just, well, you just need to just touch someone or just, well, worse and more, don't do this, please. Don't, or you can like cough on someone. Exactly. So, that's how a biological virus works. Now, a computer virus works exactly the same way. It's exactly the same idea as a natural biological virus. Now, you don't need to know this. So here it is, based on two words, propagation, the spreading, and piggybacking. Okay? So a biological virus has two important, has two important properties, propagating and piggybacking. Okay? The spreading and how does it actually run on someone else. So in a computer virus, it actually propagates itself by attaching itself to, uh, to a host file of some words. Now, a virus can be any sort of form. It can be an executable, usually as an EXE or a zip file or an email attachment. 
a document containing macros, a book, like it can be any. A virus can be, it has to be just a, a, a file of some sort. Now, here's the funny thing. Modern viruses work this way. When spreading and propagating, the virus do not need to be an exact copy of itself. This is a very important point. Why do I have to make this important point about propagating? Um, well, I think a whole bunch of boogers. A perfect example, look, I guess I'm so used to that kind of stuff. Um, a virus back in the heydays was an exact copy of itself. Usually it was. Now, doesn't need to be an exact copy of itself. I want you to keep a note of this, and I want you to think about it because this is going to be one of the very last comment I, I have to uh, uh, of today. That is to make it very clear now is antivirus is bullshit. I repeat, antivirus software, generally speaking, is bullshit. So how you actually get it, how you actually spread a computer virus is you send an infected file to someone and that person executes the file, it will infect the person's files and system as well. Also viruses do not reinfect uh, viruses. So if you already have the flu or you have the cold, you cannot get the cold or the flu again while you're already currently sick. So, all right. So now, I'm going to give you a real good example of a virus. Let's do an example. I'm going to show you this virus. This is a real source code, working source code. This is called Foo Virus. This virus was written in 2006 by Avi Kak, Professor Avi Kak at Purdue University. Thank you so much for after all these years for letting me use this. Now, this piece of virus is only 37 lines long. Not bad. And it's written in Perl. And for those of you who have never worked with Perl, I hope you don't. Back in the heydays, it was the Perl was the thing. It was like the hardest thing, especially to do any system administration tasks and scripting. However, learning Perl is like voodoo. So I want to make a warning is that this virus is, innocu is, 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 is very safe. It's a, really a demonstration program of how easy it is to write a self-replicating program. So I'll just read it out. This virus will actually, it literally is voodoo. I do not recommend anyone to learn Perl. It's, you know, a long time ago I worked with someone that said Perl is a dead language and I like, didn't believe it. Well, I, I want to concede, I am wrong. This virus will infect all, file, all files, name, ending, and dot foo in the directory in which you execute an infected file. If you send in this infected file to someone and they execute it, then that foo file will be damaged too. And this is notice is a very, that this is a safe virus for educational purposes only since it does not carry a harmful payload. All it does is just print out this message and comment out the code in the dot foo file. Same. So how this virus really works is the first thing it'll print out is just print out this big blob of message, big message. But then what happens is this. Lines 23 to 24, I'm just going to say very loosely speaking, it's going to make an entire copy of itself. This entire, all 37 lines of code. That's what it's going to do. That's what the loop is from line 23 to 25. Then what it's going to do is going to take a look, and then it's going to, it's going to actually, in the current working directory, get all files ending in .foo. What it's going to do is just going to open up the .foo file. For each and every .foo file, it opens up, comments all the lines out, plop the 37 lines of uh, uh, virus code on top of it, on top of the commented stuff, and also changes some permissions of the file. Perl programming and where the all character strings are valid program. Oh yes, that is absolutely true. And so I'm going to demonstrate this on the server right now. Here it is. I have uh, a folder called malware, and I have foovirus.pl. Great. So now what I am going to do is I'm going to make a whole bunch of files. Bim, Christy. Oh, oh, oh. 
Okay, I'm gonna say VM. Who else I'm gonna use? Okay, I'm gonna have another person. I'm gonna have who else that I see here? Vim Avocado. So do something like that. I don't know. All right. So I created one, two, three, four, five files. All right. Now, this time around, what I want to do is I want to do an LS minus LA. Now I want you to take a look. I want each and every one of you to take a visual snapshot of this result, this LS minus LA. Take a visual snapshot. Visual snapshot. And what I mean by that is notice the file permissions Notice the file size. Notice the timestamps. Also notice the color as well. If you take a look at ASTALL.FI, you see 9. That should be 9 bytes, right? Should be 9 bytes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I think there's about 9. All right. Vim. Uh, let me do a more avocado.foo. You have a seven bytes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, something like that. It's like seven bytes there. All right. Let's take a look at Christy. You got nine bytes at three, six. Yeah, look like there's nine bytes here. Okay. Yeah, look like nine bytes. Now you take a visual snapshot of the file permission. And the file size, the timestamp. Now, I'm going to execute the full virus. I'm going to execute the full virus. Watch what happens. You notice something very important that I did. I had to type in .foovirus.pl and I hit the enter key. That was possible to, to do. So the dot slash, the dot slash .foovirus.pl works because the initial version of foovirus is an executable. So here I am, I just ran .foovirus.pl. There you go, this is a demonstration of easy it is to write a self-replicating program, yada, yada, yada. Now, I'm going to clear the screen, and now I'm going to do an LS minus LA again. Anyone notice the differences now? Notice something? So, take a look at the file permission, take a look at the size. And also, do you also notice something really interesting about the color, if, it, if it's an executable file? You also notice that there are not one, but two files that are quote-unquote the same. A star dot fee and a KQJ file. They didn't change at all. 
They're still 9 and 17 bytes respectively. They did not change. Why? Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, they, these are the only two files that do not end in .boo. For those files that ended in .boo, Avocado, Christie, and Zen, a little different story. As you know, the files that now ended that ended it dot that ended in dot foo, they had their file permission changes now all seven seven seven. The file size has ballooned, and ultimately because it's an executable on Linux land, the file is bolded. Now let's take a look at avocado dot foo. Now. There you go. This is avocado dot foo. Look at Christie. There you go. One more. And that's the next. Fuba. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, let me actually now go and create two other files. Vim snoozer We have snoozer Kyle Alright We also have Bobby Table And we'll do one more. I always forget Chris's last, how to spell Chris's last name. Ah, shoot, I could have did block up. Yeah, I... Yeah, I'll just do flock up. Well, all right. So now I created two additional that foo files and one file that is of a really weird. Yeah, I got it right there. So now I'm just gonna run Bobby Tables. No, we're not gonna do a SQL injection. Oh, um, let's run uh, avocado dot foo. By the way, yep, by now I can run avocado dot foo. Remember, I didn't have to run foovirus.pl and just run avocado dot foo. There you go. And when I run avocado.foo, the, oh, the previous .foo files did not get affected at all. However, what did get affected were bobbytable.foo and snoozakyle.foo. Huh, interesting. How, huh, the commenting out is really messed up for this one. I don't know. Okay. Uh, at any rate, did the job. Yeah. Also, um, while you're here, Freedom, um, one big change I am going to do this semester. While I'm gonna take a take a quick time, a quick time out. FYI, the last Twitch stream of this semester of this season will not be a vicious rant. This the final Twitch session of this uh, of this course this semester it's the last Thursday of this month is going to be about where do you go from here because apparently a lot of people like to have that discussion on Twitch they don't want to be I rather have the vicious rant uh, in person I rather do that in person but the where do you go from here thing uh, talk about where do you get from where you go from here let's open that up to even people that are not in uh, the Tufts course. Uh, that's going to be the biggest, biggest difference. And hopefully you can join in, uh, Freedom. Yeah, because I'm sure you have uh, you have a lot to say about that. Because you're also in the side. Wow, really, you're in the security business. Um, so, like, where do you go from here? And also, we can talk about what we all wish we got out of our uh, education. Uh, what did we miss? What what did we hope if we had to do this all over again? What did we hope that we learned? Uh, you know, before we get into the business security business that we're in. So this is an example of uh, malware. 
this is an example of a, of a virus, okay? It's very safe, really uh, safe, it's, you know, uh, no, no harm, no foul, uh, but it really just showed how a, uh, a virus works, the piggybacking and the propagation. Again, very important note that how the virus spreads and work is there has to be an ex something has to execute. There had to be some action, a human action, like running an executable or like opening up a file. That's the key to how, uh, that's a really important key of a virus. And that's the biggest difference between the virus and a worm. A worm, on the other hand, I already did that, does not need to attach itself to another file. How a worm works is, it just spreads its, it just spreads on its own. A worm just spreads on its own. It just works on its own, and it works on its own over computer networks. Okay? So, how does a worm spread on its own? Well, you know how worms work, it, you know, you already know. You have already done that kind of stuff. It's a use remote com I mean, you have an idea, you have an understanding and the tools and techniques to actually write a worm. How a worm works and spread on its own is, well, use things like RSH, SSH, sockets, password cracking, you know, those basic concepts that we have gone over in this course. Uh, scanning. Yeah, when we did network reconnaissance, how a worm works, select random IP address. Hey, the dumbest worm that you anyone can write a worm. You know, all you need to do at the most doped to the dumbest level is just that. Uh, you ever see the Family Guy episode that goes one 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 one? Uh, that uh, Stewie was dialing like every phone number, like in the tell like every phone number and uh, possible to find 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 the find the phone phone number one 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 yeah, I mean, you can, all you need to do is just, well, the most dumbest level is just write a, a similar script that goes from 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0.255.255.255.255. And you, you just do send a bunch of small packet, connect to vulnerable services, exploit the vulnerability, open up shell. That's it. Now, I want to talk about the very most famous worm of them all, the analysis of the very first worm called the Morris worm. Named after Robert Tappan Morris. He brought down the internet in 1988 with just 99 lines of code. The idea was very simple, just connect to another computer, find and use one of several vulnerabilities, password cracking and a buffer overflow and finger D, and just copy yourself to another computer. However, the big mistake was uh, Robert Tappan Morris actually broke this uh, piece of co code. Uh, both the code, original code, and a copy would then repeat these actions in an infinite loop on, com on computers. Well, at the, at the end, it actually caused 10 to $100 million worth of damages, and it was the first conviction in the United States under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which I have mentioned in this class many moons ago, many weeks ago, when we talked about when you try to validate a username and password, don't log into other people's account because you, that is in violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Sure enough, this is the very first conviction under the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Now, there happened to be a happy ending. Robert Tappan Morris now is a full professor at MIT. So there's some good that can come out of this, okay? So um, all I know is people have told me, yeah, I mean, Rob Morris is a great guy. He did a few Y Combinator startup, but yeah, just don't mention this about him. <laughs> all right. Other worms include uh, Code Red. Uh, this was uh, Microsoft IIS, which is their Microsoft's web server. They had a bug in MS01, uh, uh, that's 033. How it worked is just pull random, random IP addresses running IIS. That was the first 20 days of the attack. Uh, this worm, all it did was just a face that, you know, just look for all the vulnerable Microsoft IS web servers, the face websites with the uh, statement hacked by the Chinese. 
And then it was even worse is that after the first 20 days, after the, the first 20 days, then the next 10 days had a trigger time for the denial of service. And that second wave infected 360,000 servers in a matter of 14 hours. These were like the heydays of worms. Like the 2000s were like the heydays of worms. Um, another one was two years later and it called Slammer. This was just a random scanning worm that just infected most of the internet address space in about 10 minutes. There was just a buffer overflow bug with machines running Microsoft SQL 2000 servers. Oh yeah, these were the heydays of worms. Um, because there were just so many vulnerabilities, especially in Microsoft products, and make it even better, and this is why still up to this day, Microsoft is still paying the price for not well for, for all their deeds in the past. Microsoft didn't care about security for so long. Microsoft literally did not care about security for like the longest time, and that's why there is a reason why even up to this day, people are still attacking Microsoft products. Still, up to this day. I mean, they had such a bad rap in terms of security that my, that Bill Gates decided, he just, he, he just pushed out a memo saying, okay, our rep reputation is going down to tatters, and yeah, and they finally, the, the, the late 2000s, early 2010, they became a leader in security. They did not care at all. Yeah, they were awful. All right. So another piece of malware is a Trojan horse. So we've gone over worm virus. I've gone over. I've done worm viruses. A Trojan horse. A Trojan horse can be a seemingly useful program that contains code that does well harmful things. Can even do covert and over uh, action like keylogger and spyware. So a good example of a Trojan horse, uh, you want me to tell you war stories of a Trojan horse? Did anyone actually grew up in the 2000s playing PC games? Anyone actually, is, but is it just a question of Microsoft? Uh, yeah, I mean, what is it? So a store feed, let me just say, the, I'm going to make this really nice and simple for you to, uh, that everyone can understand. Friend and luminary Dan Gear says, what was it? The bigger you are, the bigger fish you are. The bigger fish uh, uh, that you are, the bigger juicier. Oh, well, no, he said something like, the bigger the the bigger you are, the juicier the target you are. The, and that's exactly why they had Microsoft. Even up to this day, I mean, back in the heydays, it was like 90% Microsoft. Now it's a little less than that. It's like 60, 70% Microsoft world. That's still a lot. Oh, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, it's more the former. It's like the popularity. I mean, there is a, there's a running joke that for years that Microsoft doesn't get, I mean, Apple doesn't get malware because no one cares about them. There's some truth to that, but that's not true anymore. That's not entirely true anymore. So it's never entirely true. So, anyway, going back to Trojan Horses. Has anyone ever downloaded PC games back in the heyday? Have you, anyone still play PC games? Did anyone actually play PC games back in the 2000s? So, I'll give you a good example. Anyone play The Sims here? Or Roller Coaster Tycoon? Anyone? Did anyone play those games? Roller Coaster Tycoon? I think that the, I think this may have been an issue with the, the uh, original Diablo, like Diablo 1 and Diablo 2, Roller Coaster Tycoon. The Sims, Sim City. Okay, Sims, okay. So, back in the days when you had to play, when you played PC, you played a lot of, okay, so Data Guru, Christy, Snoozer, Kyle. Can I ask you this? When you remember when you played those games on a PC, did you have to put the CD, did, did you have, before you played the game, you had to put the CD in the CD drive? Like, you had to play the game with the CD in the drive. Warcraft as well, too. Do you remember that? You had to put the CD in the CD drive. I don't know if you remember that. I certainly remember. Okay, so Data Goods, okay. But not, all right. So, here's the reason why that you had to put the CD in the CD drive before you turn on the game and so you can play the game. Yeah. The reason was... Uh, it was, quote-unquote, the proof 
that, you know, you bought and own the game. So basically, it was like the real, the sole reason why uh, you put the CD in the CD drive and to, to play the game was to prove that you, well, have the physical copy of the CD and then you own the game. All right. That was as good as what they call what? Digital rights management back in the heydays. All right. Had weird things done to the disc and made them uncopyable. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here's the thing. The problem is putting a CD into the CD drive to play a game, it became really a pain in the ass. So what did we do? So back in the days, I don't know if anyone did this. Did you ever had something called no CD cracks? You ever had something called no CD cracks? So what you would do is you would go to some sketch, like some website, like usually that's sort of like Wears or something. You would download the, ex uh, download, a, well, you would download the executable, the main executable of the game. Like in this case, World Coast of Kaikun was called RCT.exe. And it would be the executable that the whole purpose why you would download it is you would download that so you don't need to put the CD in the damn drive. Okay? So they were called no CD cracks. All right? So no CD cracks were just binary files that you would just download. So you don't need to put the CD in the CD drive to play the game. Because putting a CD in the CD drive got really friggin' annoying. So it would really be, yeah, it sucked. But here's the thing, Donald. Okay, but here's the thing, Donald, is that half of the time you download like a no CD crack binary, it would do like some really sketchy ass things to your computer, like monitor like all your keystrokes, or just have like random pop-ups, or just keep on to like some, some server in like no man's land. It would like do some really weird things. So you had no idea what you were downloading, but the only thing you gave if you cared about was you can play the game without the CD. So anytime you download that kind of software, you are always getting more than you bargained for. Yeah, it was not fun. Whoever cracks it get to put the demo screen. Yeah. I mean it would really annoy. It would really like um my favorite one was the Sims. Um the Sims actually had a crack that actually had a CD crack that actually allowed you to have like nude characters. That was so popular, people liked that. But then when they actually downloaded it, it's like, oh, stole like all the Microsoft Word files on your computer. Yeah. So that's what a Trojan horse is. So the whole idea of a Trojan horse is based on the same Trojan horse. What's the, 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 the story? I always say like Sparta versus Greece or something. The, the mythology of the Trojan horse. Yeah, here it is. From the Greeks, uh, yeah, to enter the city of Troy. I always forget what the real story is. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, here is my favorite piece of malware. And, by the way, this won't be a good co a good, uh, good Twitch session if we don't do something real and we don't uh, blow your mind out. Back door. This is bad stuff. Backdoor is my favorite piece of malware. Why is a backdoor? Because it looks generally simple, but it bypasses every single security mechanism on your computer. It just grants an attacker remote access to your computer. Connects to the, uh, connecting to a remote computer? How do you do that? Yeah, you just remember something called Netcat? This backdoor are extremely deadly. Okay, because it bypasses any auto security mechanism uh, uh, on your computer, including password authentication. All an attacker needs to do, you know, to a computer riddled with a backdoor, just connect to it. Get great access. Just get in. And backdoors are unfortunately still a big thing. It's now in the con used in the content of, have you ever, do you remember the uh, Apple case of the San Bernardino uh, murders? Um, and how the government wants to put a back door onto any like phone, iOS device, phone, uh, tablet, whatever it is. Uh, because so law enforcement can have unfeathered access in case of an emergency. It's the same idea. Okay. So, 
it's still a major problem up to this day. So, again, um, you have governments now asking for a backdoor on like every single tool. Every, governments have been asking for backdoors into phone, tablet, computers, any software to give law enforcement unfeathered access. Yeah. Uh, let me do an iPhone backdoor FBI. Yeah, let's not talk about phone charges because I've been dealing with it uh, for years. The FBI deeply concerned, uh, here it is, uh, deeply concerned about Apple's new security products. And the FBI wants backdoor access. And the FBI believed that Apple should uh, help it obtain information to investigate a terrorist attack. Apple believed that creating a backdoor into the phone would weaken security and could be used. Well, you get the idea. Okay. Yes, they did. Uh, I am going to allow... How you swipe? All right. So let me just demonstrate to you how deadly a backdoor can be using a real backdoor. And I want to tell you one of my favorite pieces of malware in the history of, well, my favorite history of, of malware. My favorite is called Tini, T-I-N-I, 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 Tini. Tini is a very simple and small backdoor for Windows, three kilobytes. The whole thing was coded in assembly. Now, you remember this whole course. Oh, hold on. First of all, I hope you all know that I've been using TCP port number 777, 7777 quite a bit in this whole class. You know, and I mean for like lab number three. Well, now you understand, you understand why. Teeny is a piece of malware that is was actually, again, it listens at port 7777 and gives anyone who connects to it a remote command prompt. Now, if you actually have teeny.exe, you can install it on Windows by just double-clicking on it. And then all you need to do to connect to that Windows machine is you just to go to the netcat, the IP address of the machine, 7777. Now, unfortunately, um, unfortunately now, um, the website to download Teeny is gone. It's no longer available, but you can still find it on the Internet Archives. Mm. Here, check this out. Yep, here's your link. I'm going to paste. <gasps> Archive.org. This is a teeny, here it is. This is the website, archive.org. It is a teeny, it's a very simple and very small backdoor for Windows, coded in an assembler. Uh, here it is. Listen to port 777 and give anyone the command prompt. Download the DXE file and run it. Connect with an ordinary Telnet client or similar to port 7777 and press enter 1. Now you see a command prompt. Okay. Now I can connect to port 7777, but nothing happened. What's wrong? Well, you have to press enter once to get the prompt. If that doesn't help, make sure you get the most recently downloaded. How do I install it? Just reboot it. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Now, if you try to download it, if I download version 1.2, you can. But watch what happens if I try to download it on Firefox. Okay. I got it. But watch. I'm going to hit save. It looks like it got downloaded. But watch this. If I go to my downloads, it says, this. well, this file contains uh, a virus or a malware. And you see a little exclamation point here. I'm going to allow the download. Are you sure you want to allow this download? This file contains a virus or a malware that will harm your computer. Yeah, I'm going to allow the download. So the bad news is most, if not all, anti-malware, antivirus engine will flag it as malware. Not the bad news. The good news you can bypass it. Okay. So you may be wondering how it works. 
want to see a video so i've done that but that's what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you a video uh when back in the days when i actually had like a a nice hacking rig at my house all right so here i am this is my windows i'm on a mac so that's my mac from November 6th, I forgot what year it was. So I'm going to open up VMware. So speaking of virtual machines, I need to have a running version of Windows. Now, again, I'm on my Mac. So I need to connect to a Windows machine on my network that I have, which is in a virtual machine. So I'm actually going to fire up Windows. Power it on. Yeah, Windows 7. Yeah, you good old days. Windows 7 was great. You can do all kind of weird stuff with it. All right, so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to open up everyone's favorite web browser in the Explorer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to go to a website to download a version of Teeny, but it's going to be um, named, um, not Teeny specifically, but it's going to be named uh, Fortnite. Remember that game? The Fork and Knife game? So I'm going to pause the video so you can see. I'm going to download. This is download no longer available. But this Teeny.exe... It just been just been instead of teeny.exe, I just renamed it like Fortnite.exe. Now I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna save it to my desktop. There it is. It's a zip file. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna close. Yeah, I'm gonna close it in the browser now. Yeah, close all the close all the damn tab. Now I'm just gonna. Well, I'm going to close this. I'm going to open up the zip file. Extract all the stuff out of it. There you go. So as you can see, this Fortnite.exe file, which I have my cursor on, been extracted from the zip file. It's three kilobytes. Also known as teeny. So I'm going to run it. I'm going to click on it a few times. Oh, very important. I want to open up cmd.exe to get my IP address. And the IP address of the Windows machine is 192.168.1.205. Again, the IP address of the Windows of this Windows 7 box is 192.168.1.205. You've seen this before, Freedom Pfeiffer? So I'm going to run. That's it. I just ran Fortnite, and I would anyone would expect Fortnite to run. But that's it. It doesn't do anything. It just, however, what it does do is just open up a port seven 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 seven. So now I'm just gonna on my Mac. Just hold on. I'm just gonna do a netcat one the IP address my two one ninety two to one sixty eight to one two hundred five seven 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 seven. I press the enter key again. Boom. Look at that. Can I fire up the calc? You bet it I can from my Mac. You bet. Now I'm going to go to my desktop and I'll leave even more traces behind. I'm just going to write, a, create a file to the desktop on Windows from my Mac. Bam. Dummy dot txt. That's that. Here I am, and this shows you how a backdoor works. And you can see how deadly it is. You know that I don't need to log in from my Mac. I don't need to log into the Windows machine. Because the Windows machine already just gave anyone access to it by way of port 7777. By running Teeny, which in this case is really what got renamed a Fortnite.exe.
Yeah. That's how deadly a backdoor is. All right. Usually a backdoor, yeah, it seems like nothing when you run it. But what it does do, it just opens up port number X, Y. It just opens up a port number. And then if anyone knows your IP address, anyone knows a port number to look for, in this case it's 7777, they can walk right in and get anything that they want. That's how deadly a backdoor is. Um, and also, you know, if you think, if now you've seen how a backdoor actually works, now think about if someone actually gave, if, think of that, if Apple gave a backdoor on all of their products. Think about if there is, imagine if there was a backdoor to all iOS devices, all Macs, you name it. So what would end up happening is, you know, yeah, they say give law enforcement access, but hell, what's preventing the, the good folks, bad folks, and anyone else to actually have access to the back door? Alcohol is bad for you, Ace Dolphy. I quit drinking uh, back in 21. It really had helped. I'm just saying. So that's a back door. Um, so this is one of my favorite. But wait a minute. I'm sure this raises a lot of questions here. So, yeah, I mean, I would not be surprised at anything. I mean, hell, forget about Apple, I mean, but there's a lot of um, talk about Intel. Basically, every Intel every Intel uh, computer has a backdoor. Because of their, um, their bootloading software. I forget what the name of it was. Um, it's the microcode in the, in the control that's even running when your computer is off. Which is, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is pretty damn well known now. Uh, so, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it out here. Um, you, so I'm sure you're, yeah, it's pretty damn nice. Um, yeah, I feel like, congratulations, Freedom Pfeiffer. Congratulations, Chris. Um, yeah. Um, it's, it, it makes a difference. I mean, I can tell you the days of dozing off on the couch, those days are long over. That's a huge difference. Sleep is hit or miss. I don't know about that, but dozing off and giving me a lot more energy, you bet it does. So, you may be wondering. Is there a way I can check a file if it's malware or not? All right. Let's do dig a little bit deeper. Let's take a look at what Virus Total says about Teeny. Go to VirusTotal.com, and what Virus Total is is analyzes files, IP addresses, anything for to detect malware and automatically share them with the community. Again, you can upload anything to Virus Total, uh, exe, PDF, PCAP, you name it. So I'm actually going to go and just drag teeny.exe into virus total and boom. There you go. 63 security vendors and two sandboxes flag this file as malicious. Now remember today we talked about viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and backdoors. One of the issues is Teeny is, is, well, is really a backdoor, but people can also call this a Trojan as well, too. Take a look at the results. Malicious hype confidence. Lots of places are calling out backdoor. Generic Win32, Teeny detected, backdoor, backdoor Trojan. This could be one of two things. I mean, so really, this is a backdoor. You can also consider that Trojan, a lot of Trojans are also backdoors as well. So Trojan feels like to be a more generic term. No. All right. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vendors that actually have said that this is not malware, including Baidu. So you may be wondering, what the hell? Why these seven did not detect this as teeny as malware? 
who knows so and now this is actually should also raise a lot of suspicions about antivirus so you know, this is this is issue number two with antivirus anti malware number one as we talked earlier you know most viruses they change form over time how does anyone actually know how antivirus really works at the most rudimentary level anyone have an idea anyone can write a, i mean for, for everyone here that's been watching and been taking the security course you all have the ability to write your own antivirus or anti-malware service at the most rudimentary level anyone wanna i mean how, how would you write one at the most rudimentary level Anyone want to take a guess? Take a stab at it. I'll give you like one guess. You, most of you will probably get in like one or two tries. I'll give you a hint. Actually, I can give you a huge hint. Good at details. Take a look at the basic properties. MD5, SHA1, SHA2. Yeah, just compare to known viruses. It's signature based. As Christy said, is Christy said is signature based. So how a lot of how antivirus worked for so many years is just based on signatures. You know, you can just you, you, you can do a comparison to a date. You do a comparison to a database of checksums and hashes or like certain keywords. That's how it works. Um, that's how it really had worked for years. That's how. Like you got even one built into Firefox, the web browser, because as you saw, you try to download teeny.exe, it wouldn't let you because it detected it as malware. Okay, look for unscanned files, look, look, yeah, and look for some binary pad. That's it. That's how, like, this is how anti malware, antivirus had worked for so long. What book is this class using? Actually, uh, Zen, if you're not in the class, we don't use the book at all. Because as I've said, and I'll say this very, very clearly, Zen, I'll say this very very clearly textbooks are a scam cybersec we're doing malware your favorite topic right now here td.exe was uh, seen first created in uh, september 2020 yeah textbooks are a complete scam uh september 5th 2020 uh, 2000 not 2020 2000 was creation time and it's been scanned quite a few times since then you can see the other names that teeny.dxe has been uploaded as. <laughs> yeah, textbooks are a goddamn scam. Target Machine Intel 86. It has a breakdown. Virus Total is your friend for when it comes to malware analysis. This should be the first thing that you use to analyze malware. Got to be the first thing to use. Um, speaking of, uh, anti, uh, um, speaking of, um, virus total and Trojans, that's the final lap of this course. Now, just a warning that this is real malware, Android malware. Why Android malware? Well, unfortunately, Android has been a catalyst for malware. That's a longer story for another day. So the final lab is a security course that analyze a real piece of Android malware. If you got an Android device, please do not upload this to your phone. It's still live. And it's still live. It's still live. Yes, it's still it's not it's not a dead piece of malware. It's still alive. So what you do is this. I'm going to give you a piece of malware, and your idea is you want to use a tool called APK tool. I actually am going to be generally nice enough to help you get started. I'm going to copy this link. I have to check some here. So I'm going to do a curl. Oh, let me do a W get. All right, here it is. Sample, okay, so I do open SSL, SHA-256, sample spring, oh, SHA-256, what am I doing? 64C, yada, yada, B83, does that match the checksum that is? Yep, it does, so I downloaded the file correctly. So I'm going to do an unzip C, 
sample spring 2023 zip I'm gonna unzip it and you're gonna get something called a sample.apk file now I want to give you uh, uh, just all you uh, a brief yeah Christy you're gonna like this one and um, believe me you're gonna like this a lot when an APK file is you know how Windows a binary extension is .exe Uh, well, the binary, the extension for Android binaries or Android apps is APK. That's what APK is. APK is the binary, an APK file is, well, the binary or the executable for Android. Now, what you're going to do after you get the sample.apk is, you're going to need to scan the APK file, just the virus, the, the virus total, just upload it. I'll let you do that. But by far and away, which it will do almost 100%, if not 100% of the work, is to use APK tool. An APK file is very much like a zip file. It's very much like a zip file. You have to extract the contents. However, you just can't use unzip. You have to use APK tool. Because what APK tool is does, it, it usually extracts the contents of the APK file, but also decompiles everything the contents can be an apk tool can be used to modify an ap uh, modify an app um so if you do type apk tool i'm using linux right now so apk tool is to reverse engineering of uh, the re-engineer reverse engineer apk files the most important uh, flag is where's the d flag Did they change it? Ah, decode. Here it is. D. Okay, I'm going to clear the screen. I have my APK for the APK tool. D sample.apk. Decode, decompile. Watch what happens. Decoding, 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 and doing back smellying. There it is. Very quick. Now what you do is you notice there's a sample folder that's been created and as uh, Christy actually has mentioned, let's go to the sample folder and here you go. A whole bunch of folders are created. I'll just give you a, uh, I'll just clear my screen and I'll give you a little brief crash course. Don't worry about the original. The most important files that you need to take a look at are android.manifest.xml, the res folder, and the smiley folder. Let me introduce, let me go to the resource folder. Let me, the most important file is the manifest file. Kirsty, uh, Christy, what is the manifest file? Do you remember, what kind of, how can you describe it? I, I have my way of describing it, but how, do you, how would you describe a manifest file? Really think of a man think of the Android manifest file as your entryway. It's like your bill of materials. That's the way I would explain it. It lists all the uh, the classes and all the requirements of the app, including permissions. So a manifest will say you, when you ever download something from the Google Play Store, you know how it says, oh, this requires the internet, it requires SD card, it requires Bluetooth. Well, you can see all the permissions that are listed here. Settings. Yep. All the settings, permissions are all listed here. Entry classes, you name it. Okay. The res folder are all your resources. This is where all the pictures, icons, strings, you name it, are all listed. The RES seen for resources. RES stands for resource. So the RES folder is where all the resources, such as pictures, icons, strings, hard code, like all the hard coded strings you use throughout the app, it's all listed here. The smiley folder 
Actually, why don't I go to res? And I go to drawable. And this is where like you have all your icon, picture, logo, buttons, and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And now the smiley folder. The smiley folder, to make a long story short how it is, it's like reading assembly. It's like reading assembly code. By assembly code for Java, which is called Smiley. So as you can see, this looks like Java. It looks like it's not Java. But it feels like, yeah, it really is like, it's, it's really, think of it as assembly, it's assembly language, but it has, but, but for Java. That's what the Smiley folder is. Yeah. So that's how you would do this final lab of the, of the course. And this is real malware. This is a real live malware. So don't install this on your device. One more thing before we go, and this is the time of the year I have to pay homage to a friend. Again, as I said earlier, that I am not the expert on malware and malware analysis. But this is where now I give a little bit of a preview for all the opportunities that you have down the road. How do you learn more about this topic? Where would you, where do you want to continue if you want to learn more about malware and malware analysis? And this is where I want to introduce our friend Malware Unicorn. Malware Unicorn, Amanda Rousseau is one of the foremost experts in malware analysis and reverse engineering. I kid you not, uh, I don't know where she is. I, she was at, she was at, she met her for a while. I think she left. You go to malwareunicorn.org. Where is she now? Yeah, let's go to that bird site. Oh, she's at Microsoft. Okay. All right. So why do I have to bring her up? Reason is, is that she uh, has given a lot of tutorials, especially for women in, uh, women in computer science and cybersecurity. She's given talks at our village at DEF CON. And she even have her own workshops. <clears throat> and one of her famous workshops is, for free, Reverse Engineering 101. It was published in 2019. It's still very relevant. And this workshop provides a foundation if you uh, found fun fundamental reverse engineering Windows malware. Yeah, so you can actually use everything that you learn here and to really, really open up teeny.exe. This is free. Yeah, she's great. So, uh, this workshop provides a fundamental reverse engineering Windows malware using a hands-on experience using RE tools and techniques. Uh, she goes through a lot of basic terms and processes. Um, the course will conclude by participating performing a hands-on malware analysis that consists of triage, static, and dynamic analysis. Gee, where have you heard those terms before? Uh, what you'll learn, you'll use virtual machines that have a safe environment, go over operating system and assembly concepts, uh, how to jump jump into code and static disassembly, then rename content, uh, yada, yada, yada. All right. And then deeper analysis of a program uh, to understand hidden functionality not understood statically, which is called static analysis. And this is reverse engineering. What is reverse engineering? Uh, it's a process of uh, extracting known or design information from any man-made of reproducing it uh, or anything based on extracted information. Basically, it takes something apart. Uh, the analysis flow from, uh, from that for our malware analysis is set up a baseline analysis environment. You don't need to do that in the last lab of this course. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Triage to determine a starting point. Static analysis. Get a sense of where everything is before debugging. Dynamic analysis means execution. Dynamic be determined behavior that can't be understood by static analysis. Talks about virtual machines, the environment setup. Anatomy of a Windows Portable Executable Format. She even talked about x86 assembly language. Ah, this is for a picture right here. This should look a little bit familiar. Ex reconnaissance, exploitation, infiltration, internal reconnaissance, entrenchment, CNC, command and control. Some of these terminologies should look very familiar to you. Exfiltration and purge. And look at the malware classes. At that. 
virus code that propagates replicates across system with user intervention. And notice the definition of a worm, code that self-propagates replicates across system without requiring user intervention. Uh, yada yada yada. Back door, back door. Back door, here it is. Enables a remote attacker to have access to or send commands to a compromised computer. Yeah. Yep, and this is all for you. It's all free. It's all free and publicly available. Now this is where I would go. This is if you want to learn more about malware and malware analysis, especially with reverse engineering. Like malware unicorns course oh yeah oh yeah static analysis and all that stuff and actually you doing which is I don't know if you hopefully you will know is that the last lab for malware analysis of that Android app you got to do that you, you have to do static analysis you're not running it and that's all I have today folks Next week, we'll talk about lawn. I think, no, no, next next Thursday. Yeah, next Thursday, we're back on Twitch. We're going to talk about, well, a little bonus coverage on law enforcement. And then the last, again, as I said earlier today, the last Twitch session in two weeks that we're going to have is on, where do you go from here? Where do you go from here? I have a random... Uh, yeah, Zen, I have a random question. How do you protect your machine when you're outside the network, perhaps in a coffee shop? What kind of resources... Yeah, 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 I can explain that. Um, yeah, here's the key. No, this is not a random, this is a good question. It's a good question. I'll say, uh, three things. Yeah, Christy, yep, yep, my pleasure. Uh, I will say three things about that, that question, that random question. How do you protect your machine when you are being outside of your network, or perhaps at a coffee shop or a hotspot or bring your own hotspot? So, number one, uh, I will let you know for right now, I don't have a whole hell of a lot installed on my computer. I don't. I don't have a lot of stuff installed. So the only thing is like, for example, I'm on a Mac. Uh, and for me, less is more. I only have the following developer tools. Burp, Visual Studio, Wireshark. Uh, I have VLC. I don't have a whole hell of a lot. I don't have any of the Microsoft products other than Visual Studio Code. I have Discord. I have two web browsers, I have a password manager, Slack, Zoom. I don't have a whole hell of a lot on the computer. So that actually helps. Oh, and I do have Lulu, which is, what Lulu is, is just basically what it is, is a uh, application whitelisting and blacklisting software, or allow list, block list. And I have a VPN. I don't have a lot. So less is more. So first of all, less is more. So... I don't, there are less opportunities like phone home to like some server out there, which is like every, what every software does. Uh, most of my stuff I do is uh, uh, on homebrew. So if I do a brew list, very small. Yeah, I just use, how I install all my software, 99% of it is using homebrew. I don't have a lot. So that helps. But here's the other thing. Every two to th every three months, I would say, and thanks to the fact that I don't have a lot on the computer, I just blow it away. So I don't know if you know. So now what is really nice on Mac OS, what is extremely nice on Mac OS, um, you go to system settings, and you go to general, you can blow your machine up anytime that you want. You don't need to reinstall the entire operating system like back in the heyday. There is now an option now to just reset the entire, yeah, here it is. Erase all content and settings. Thank God this is available now because back in the day, it would take like four to five hours to install the, reinstall the entire Mac OS, just that alone. Now it's just one button just blow everything away. So I do that like once every two to, like every two to three months. I don't have a lot anyway. So I basically get, think of it this way, I start from scratch uh, all the time, and it feels like you get a brand new computer each time, which is nice. Um, the, really, it leads to a two-way or an issue number three. Uh, what Bill Hannon, my friend Bill, he's been on the show before. He said, uh, I wish he was here because he can confirm, because I know he said this. He said, uh, yeah, I just always assumed that it was, it's not a matter of, 
he says something along the lines, not a matter if something will happen, but when. So you always, like, assume that your machine will be hacked or broken into. And that's why I do it. Like, every two to three months, I just blow my machine away. Yeah. Yeah. So that is how, like, when I come back from Vegas, from DEF CON, oh, yeah, I blow my machine away when I come home. I just start from scratch. You don't trust anything after that day, after that week. So that's that. Would it make sense to write a script that alarms you at time to uh, one? Yeah, that's what I have Lulu for. So what Lulu is, is a, is a kind of a network monitor, and it's just say, okay, who's trying to use the network? Uh, here's all my apps I have. So what it is, that's what Lulu is for. Uh, so Lulu, hold on. It's a firewall. Yeah, it's a Mac OS firewall, the free version. Lulu is the Mac OS firewall. It just no. It, it just uh, uh, it just uh, 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 oh shoot. You know what? Speaking of this mess, yeah, uh, here it is. So it's just a, it's a free Mac OS firewall. Anyone who's trying to connect to the internet somewhere. No. One more thing before we go. I know we're really over time today, but this is just anyone. Can, if you have other class, you can go. Um, this is like the final shot. Why I don't why antivirus is so crap. Anyone use Norton? You know, anti Norton antivirus now mines cryptocurrency, right? Yeah. Norton antivirus that adds erythium. This is not an April Fool's joke. Here's the other irony. You want something really ironic? And I, I don't know if a bunch of people says like, yeah, here it is. Here's another irony is, is that antivirus software and security software is supposed to protect you. But it is pretty well known that the security software like antivirus are some of the worst software in terms of software. With security, there are so many bugs and vulnerabilities in them. It's not even funny. I have not run antivirus like since the two since the early two thousands. Fair. Just want to let you know, I have not used antivirus, not used or installed antivirus for over twenty years, and it's gotten worse over time. There you go. Yeah, antivirus. In Norton antivirus now mines cryptocurrency, so it's like. WTF, really? All right, other than that, hey, it's a good day out there. Go enjoy it. All right, so I, 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 I'm done. Yeah, so now you know why I said antivirus is bullshit. Always was. More about that in my vent in person on the last day of class. Thanks, all. Yeah, thanks, everyone. That was fun.